I often read from Ephesians before I begin, and today I'd like to do that again. From Ephesians chapter 1, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. I, uh, I am just so excited about the fullness of what God has for you as individuals uh, as we learn and as we dive in to th- even this great subject of worship. God is for you. If he's for you, who can be against you? Are you ready for the word this morning? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. Come and move amongst us. Come and touch our hearts and our minds. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might not just receive but retain and retain and grow. And Lord, that we would walk into the fullness of all that you would have for us in your kingdom and in your ways. In your name, amen. Okay, so this guy spots a sign outside a house that reads, Talking Dog for Sale. Intrigued, he walks in. So what have you done with your life, he asked the dog. I've led a very full life, said the dog. I lived in the Alps, rescuing avalanche victims. I uh, served my country in Iraq. And now I spend my days reading to the elderly in a retirement home. The guy's flabbergasted, and he asks the dog's owner, he said, why on earth would you get rid of a dog like this? And the owner replied, because he's a liar. He hasn't done any of those things. (laughs) Just give it some time. You'll get it. Okay, well, I'll try one more. <laughs> Jake and Johnny and Billy died and went to heaven. Welcome, St. Peter said. You'll be very happy here if you just obey our rule. Never step on a duck. If you step on a duck, it causes a big racket, and all the other ducks, it starts quacking, and all the other ducks start quacking, and it makes just, it's just so much noise, so don't do it. Well, that sounded simple enough until they passed through the pearly gates and found thousands of ducks everywhere. And Jake stepped on one right away, and the duck quacked, making an unholy racket, and then they all quacked, and Peter came up to Jake, bringing a ferocious-looking Amazon woman, and he chained him to her and said, I warned you, if you broke the rule, you would be punished. And he was chained to her for eternity. Several hours later, Johnny stepped on a duck, and the duck quacked, and they all began to quack, and St. Peter stepped up to Johnny with an angry-looking, shrewish woman and said, as your punishment, you'll be chained to this woman for eternity. Billy was extremely careful not to step on a duck. Several months went by, and then Peter came up to him with a gorgeous blonde and chained her to Billy, uniting them for all eternity. And wow, Billy exclaimed, wonder what I did to deserve such a, to to, to deserve this. And she said, I don't know about you, but I just stepped on a duck. (laughs) We're spending time... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're, spending, we're spending time talking about worship. And um, last week I shared with you, if you put it on the screen, uh, last week I shared with you that anything you have to check with before obeying the Holy Spirit is an idol. And we talked about how uh, in his book, when uh, the revolution started, N.T. Wright shared that he felt the biggest issue in North American society was idolatry. And that idolatry was robbing us of experiencing the fullness of God. And again, it's important that we understand that your worship will only ascend to the level that your idolatry will allow. Your worship will only ascend to the level that your idolatry will allow. The Bible says you should have no other gods before you because idols will always demand the high ground of your heart. Now, last week I shared with you the importance of of us actually growing beyond culture in our Christianity. I'm not a Canadian Christian. One of the mistakes that we make as Canadians is, is we, we walk in an in a out-of-balance sense of humility and an out-of-balance sense of weakness, or meekness, sorry, and we don't, we, don't, we don't really express the nature of God. And then if anybody rises up and gets expressive, if anybody rises up to greatness, tall poppy syndrome comes and cuts them down. And we look at people, immediately we assume they're proud because they're being expressive, or we assume that they're, that they're trying to be something more than they are because they're stepping into greatness. 
I'd like to submit to you that humility isn't self-deprecating. Humility is greatness that doesn't need glory. Meekness isn't being weak. Meekness is great strength under authority. And we have a responsibility as believers to reflect the kingdom that we're a part of. But what happens is our Canadian culture will exalt itself above the knowledge of Christ. And will, especially in our worship, will hold us back from really worshiping the Lord with all of our might. Because, well, don't get too expressive. That's not our way. Don't be too, you know, don't get too exuberant. That's not our way. That's not how we do it as Canadians. You were not brought into this kingdom of God, to be a Canadian Christian, you're called to be a kingdom Canadian. That means that all of the beauty of our culture, when it's submitted to the lordship of Jesus, shines through, and the wonder of who we really are gets expressed. But any time that a culture would exalt itself above the nature of the kingdom of God, that culture is setting itself up as an idol. It's setting itself up, it's setting itself up as a god. The reason that this stretches us is because we have a mindset that we've believed as Canadians that we shouldn't be expressive because, I mean, that's what the Americans do. And they do enough of it for all of us. <laughs> and while it can be true that things can get out of balance to the other side, the fact of the matter is, is that God is not honored in out of balance humility or demonic humility. God's not honored in that. And so as believers, you see, you gotta... You know, this is so important. There's a reason behind this. I believe that God wants to move in our nation in a powerful way. I believe that revival, renewal, transformation is coming to our nation in powerful ways. And God is desiring that the church step into her role in community to bring that transformation. It's not about, it's not about legislating righteousness. It's about leading righteously. It's not about legislating righteousness. It's about leading righteously. That's a little better response. There's more of you on this side. Now, but it, what breaks my heart about my nation is this. Did you know that there have been three, in history there have been three, recent history, three profound moves of God in Canada? The first profound move happened in the late 1800s in eastern Canada, in Hamilton, I believe, where a prayer movement began that actually spread to the states and from there went to the world. A powerful movement of prayer that brought transformation started in eastern Canada in the late 1880s. And then in the mid-1900s, the latter rain movement out of North Battleford, where God began to move in power and prophetic signs and wonders. And people were absolutely transformed. People are still, there are denominations, there are churches that are still, that were born out of that, that are still operating today all over the world. That move had impact, had international impact, and God moved in power on account of it through Canadians. And then thirdly, in Toronto in the late 1990s, or in the mid-1990s, where a powerful move of God happened at the Airport Vineyard Church, now known as Catch the Fire, and millions, literally millions of people from all over the world came and were touched and filled by God. And some of the most significant moves of God that are happening now internationally are a result of what happened in Toronto. Bill Johnson was touched there by God. Heidi Baker was touched there by God. Cheon was touched there by God. Just to name a few. And yet in this nation that has such rich heritage in the move of God, we have yet to fully experience the inheritance of these incredible moves. Why is that? Well, because every move of God, every revival, every renewal, every significant move of God is reflected in worship. And Canadian culture has exalted itself to such a fashion that it manages to squelch the worship of the body of Christ of the new move. And as soon as that comes up, we start cutting people off at the knees and telling them, don't be expressive. Don't dig in like that. You're not being Canadian. And you're not being Canadian. You're being kingdom, which trumps culture all the time. We have this rich inheritance waiting for worshipers to rise up and take. And I believe that his gateway begins to enter into, her, into the fullness of her love relationship with God. 
that we'll begin to see the transformative power of God released in our region in profound ways. We, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the vision and direction and passion that the Lord has for this region that he wants to do through Gateway. We haven't even scratched the surface, and we've done some good things, but God has got great things waiting to happen through you. Not just through the vision of me or the leadership, not just from the pulpit, but through you in your everyday walk with God that's a reflective, that, that reflects the nature of his kingdom, that as you walk in worship and just love him as you live, you are going to be able to see profound things begin to happen because God wants to use you. Now, It says, you see the second scripture there, if you want to bring it up, please. It says this. Those who make them idols become like them, and all who trust in them. Now, this is important because God understands, like, say, why is worship so important, Landon? Because God is making it clear that you become like what you worship. I'm going to share a little bit more on that in your personal transformation in just a little bit. But you become like what you worship. If you worship money, you're going to become like the greed that's attached to it. If you worship fame, you're going to become like the pride that's attached to it. Because that's the way that it works. You become like what you worship. Now, last week we, we spent some time talking about the, high, the why, what, and how. The high, the high stuff. <laughs> it came out wrong. I, I forgive you for laughing. Um, but the first thing we talked about was proskuneo, the word for worship in the New Testament which means to turn towards, to kiss. We, we say it here this way, turning my attention with the intention of affection. Now, the mistake that we often make, though, is that we turn our attention to the Lord with the intention of receiving affection. But that's not what worship is. Worship is about giving. It's turning our attention with the intention of giving affection. See, that's why some people miss out on the goodness of God. Because they come determining to receive, but unwilling to give. And the kingdom principle is give and you receive. And so we come before him with the intention of giving affection. And in turn, God, because he's a lover of our souls, can't help it. He wants to return and love back on us. But that simple shift in, po in, in uh, posture robs us of experiencing God's presence. And that's why sometimes you can be in a room and people are saying, oh, his presence is so good. And you're like, well, I'm not feeling nothing. Well, perhaps you came with the desire to only receive and you haven't been willing to give. Secondly, we talked about worship, become, or work becoming life. Remember, I, I said one of the hardest things that we, we do is we have a hard time separating the word worship from sing-song time at the church. And then I said worship and you said See, th thanks. God love you. A couple of you remember. Thanks for that. But it, was, it was hard uh, last time when you all stared at me. <laughs> but we have a hard time separating that. But our return, our return to Adam's nature when we get saved, and I don't have time to talk about all of that right now, but if you, if you watch last week, you'll, you'll see it, but makes everything we do, everything Adam did, his work was worship. His life was worship. Adam didn't have a group of people to gather with to worship. It was just him. But his life was worship. God wants your everyday life, everything that you touch, every, every nail that you hammer, every student that you teach, he wants that all to be an act of worship. He, you can be in his presence all the time by simply posturing yourself in the third element, which was thanksgiving. A posture of thanksgiving creates an awareness that everything that you have is from God and he's worthy. It becomes a proper lens for our life. And we talked about it, but I'll remind you. Some of you looked at me when I said that all you have to do is be thankful and you can experience the presence of God. And some of you looked at me and I read, I read you like books when you looked at me because and, and, I could hear you saying, but Landy, Landy, I hate my job. I hate the people. I think I work for the devil. Josh, was that you? <laughs> the thing about Thanksgiving is that then worship becomes the great diversion. Because worship diverts your attention to a greater reality. 
we see the greater reality of the kingdom over our reality. When we're engaged in worshiping the Lord, we're seeing His reality overlapping our reality. And we can engage His presence and know His goodness. Now, I just want to talk about, just for a moment, just put that back up there, please, guys. In James 1, 2, and 4, it says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Various trials. As I've looked in the scriptures, I've seen trials, but I've also seen fiery trials. And many of you have experienced one or the other. I would say trials are when your stuff is touched, whether it's your, your finances, your, what you own, you know, your job, things, the things that are around you get touched and you go through a trial. The enemy attacks it and you go through a trial. Fiery trials are when it, when it hits your blood, when, it, when it's a family member that's sick or you're sick or, you know what I mean, when it, when it hits you in, in, in the heart. There's stuff that hit, hits your atmosphere, hits where you live, but there's other things that hit you in, in your heart. The thing about worship in the midst of trial is this. Worship in trials give you perspective. Worship in fiery trials give you comfort. And God's design in worship is for you to either see it from his perspective so that you can posture yourself in what you need to not only get through. And listen, if you're going through hell, keep going. Don't camp. Keep going. But worship gives you a heavenly perspective on it. And it diverts your attention to the greater reality and you can dig into what God says to do to get through. But in the midst of fire, worship brings comfort. Because sometimes we just don't understand. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But perspective and comfort are yours in trial through worship. So today I I want to just take a few minutes and I want to talk about the value of worship. In Colossians 2, 13 uh, to 15, it says this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set aside, he set these aside, sorry, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Now listen. Worship is your most reasonable response to the gospel. The covenant of the gospel, if you're not sure what that all means, covenant simply means an unbreakable, an unbreakable promise because of unconditional love. That's what covenant is. The covenant of the gospel is God's unbreakable promise to mankind because of his unconditional love for us. See, oftentimes we think that the gospel is something that we have to do, and it's not. No hostage can save themselves, and we were held hostage to sin. And so the nature of covenant is that a covenant is between two parties. A covenant isn't like a contract because a contract is goods and services returned to one another, but a covenant is the willingness to lay down your life for one another. Now, God knew that we as humans, the Bible says, he remembers that we're made of dust. God knows our capacity. He knows that we just don't have the capacity to do things forever because number one, we die. And number two, we, we can tend to be a little weak sometimes. And some of you have thought coming to Christ means you have to keep your Christianity. I, I'm, I'm a good Pentecostal boy. I was born and raised in Pentecost. And so I was always kind of taught that you got to be good or else you're going straight to hell. So you mess up, and you don't get it right. You don't fix it. You know, you're on dangerous ground. And so, like, man, I got saved at every thunderstorm. I thought, man, Jesus is coming back, and, 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 and I had an impure thought just there, and you know what I mean? And, and I had no security in what I was given. Now, I, I, I want to be clear. I don't believe in eternal security in the sense that you can just get saved and live any, live any way you want. Because eventually you'll get deceived and turn your back on Christ. So I don't believe that you can just say you're eternally secure. But I will say this. I think it's a lot harder to lose your salvation than we think. And, and here's why. 
Because God the Father represented himself. He represented deity in the gospel. God the Son represented humanity. So of the two parties, Jesus came in flesh as God, representing us. Remember David and Goliath? You guys have heard me say this. When David went out unto and, and fought Goliath, he represented all of Israel, meaning all of Israel was in David. Whatever was going to happen to him was going to happen to all of Israel. Should David lose, all of Israel was going to lose. Should David win, all of Israel would win. In the same way, we, humanity, were in Jesus when he was on the cross. He was our representative meaning that his victory is my victory. So think of it this way. God the Father represented deity. God the Son, Jesus, represented humanity. And the gospel is a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. That's why it's unbreakable. That's why it's unconditional. And you and I are beneficiaries. That's why we receive an inheritance and not a wage. Oh, come on now. That, now, now they beat you. I said, that's why we receive an inheritance and not a wage. In fact, the Bible says that when you try to receive wages, you're sinning because the wages of sin is death. We can't earn it. We've done nothing. We can't earn it and we can't keep it, but we keep doing everything we can to prove that we should have it. And we don't have to. Worship is your first and most appropriate response to the overwhelming nature of the covenant of the gospel. When you get saved, your first and most profound response to being saved, your first and most profound continual response, God isn't going to be impressed if you try to work for it because he's done all the work on your behalf. God isn't going to be impressed if you try to pay for it because you could never pay for it. He paid for it for you. You were ransomed. God will only be impressed with a heart filled with worship and thanksgiving. So ridiculously out of balance, so ridiculously uh, tipped in our favor is this thing called the gospel covenant that the only appropriate response is worship. Oh, this is such good news. If you've been trying to impress God by the way you've been living, now live as an act of worship. Don't get me wrong. Live as an act of worship. If you're doing something and you can't give God glory for it, then you've got to question the value of doing it. So live as an act of worship. But recognize that the gospel covenant, the unbreakable promise because of his unconditional love for you, brings you allows you to step into this place where the only appropriate response is, I love you for this. This is mine. I have an inheritance. I'm loved. I'm free. Thank you, God. Your most appropriate response to the gospel is to worship the Lord. It even trumps living for him because in worshiping him, you'll naturally live for him. But it's pretty easy to religiously live for him and not worship. That's why worship is so valuable. Make sense? Always remember that the covenant of the gospel is absolutely, unbelievably tipped in your favor. So why does it have so much value? Well, like I said earlier, Scripture says that you become like what you worship. We're called to be conformed into the image of Jesus. That's what it says in the Word. Worship brings us into that confirmation. We start to look like Christ when we worship because you become what you worship. Uh, you might not be understanding, so I'll take one more second and share it with you. And by the way, I'll cheer myself on this morning. It's just you're a little quiet. Think of it this way. Many of us desire to become like Christ. We all want to be like Jesus. The thing is, is that it's awfully hard to do that in our own strength. And we run out of gas doing it. But if the Bible is true, and it is, 
If you become like what you worship, then being conformed into the image of Jesus is as simply is as simple as spending time in his presence and loving on him. And the more you love on him, the more you're going to look like him. Amen. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to try. You just simply have to choose to worship, to lift up the name of the Lord, to live your life in a posture of thanksgiving, honoring God, letting him be the lens that you view everything through, letting him give you perspective and comfort in every situation. And being a carrier of his presence. He resides in praise. If you live in worship, you'll be residing in his presence. That's why having an upward focus is so important. So that people, when they have an intersection with you, they're having an intersection with the presence of God because you're carrying that presence. That's why we worship. I mean, so, I mean, it just works at every level. You worship so that you look like him, so that you get changed, transformed into his image. And then on the top of that, you worship because you're in his presence, carrying his presence, so that when people come by you, they get confronted with his goodness because you're carrying it, because you're in it. I think I've said this, but I just, I pay more attention to it now. So like you come by me, like look out, just don't get too close because you just don't know because I'm carrying his presence right now, and you could just, <sighs> good things are going to happen. Amen. I purposely touch people when they hand me, hand me stuff, because you just never know. You just might get healed. You just might get delivered. You just might have an encounter. Why? Because I am an encounter with God. Because I'm walking with him. I'm talking with him. I'm living in his presence. I am an encounter with God. I am, now listen to me, listen to me, this is important. I am the answer to Jesus' prayer when he said, let your kingdom come and will be done. Because I am an encounter with his kingdom. So when I'm here, you should have an encounter with his kingdom. And that goes for you too. You're the answer to that prayer. You're his kingdom come. You're meant to be an encounter with God wherever you go. But you see, we can't do it in the spirit of religion. Can't do it just performing. Because there's no presence in religion. There's no, perf there's no presence in performing. But there's presence in worship. And I don't even have to try. I just have to love. It's so cool. So... This scripture, if you put it up there, our souls have escaped like a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we are escaped. That's why we worship. I was trapped, but now I'm free. I was lost, but now I'm free. I was bound up, but now I'm free. And that's why I worship. This gospel is worth worshiping God. Now, why does, okay, that's why worship has value. But why does our worship have value? What's so important about my worship to God? Well, first of all, your perfected imperfection holds great value to God. In Hebrews 10, 14, it says, by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Another scripture says it this way. He is, he is forever made holy those who he, are, he is making holy. He is forever made holy those who he is making holy. What does that mean? Well, 25, 26 years ago, Kathy and I stood in front of a preacher. And as we stood there, he had us say some vows. And then he said to her, do you? And she said, I do. And then he said to me, do you? And she said, he does. <laughs> and then we were married. <laughs> now on that day, legally, Kathy and I couldn't be more married. We were as legally married as we could possibly be. But after 26 years, relationally, we're way more married. And it's the same thing in your relationship with Jesus. When you come into a saving knowledge of Christ, when you choose Jesus, when you choose the promise that he's given you, when you choose that, you can't be more saved. And yet, 
as you relate to him, as you walk with him, as you journey with him, you get more saved. You're saved being saved. You're holy being made holy. There's the positional relationship with Christ that cannot be changed, but there's the progressive relationship with Christ that grows. Now, in the context of a marriage, if you stop talking, if you stop loving one another, your marriage is going to break down. Well, it's the same thing in your walk with Jesus. If you stop talking, if you stop engaging, if you stop creating space for intimacy, your relationship with him is going to break down. He's not going to change, but we're changing. And that's why relationship with Christ can break down. Now, when it comes to worship, why does our, perf- why does our imperfection our perfected imperfection, why does that matter? Well, think of it this way. Imagine you were receiving art, and you received uh, art from an artist, a painting from an artist, and, and say, a drawing from your daughter. Now, the painting from the artist might be way more perfect. It might be done way better. And, and, but which one will hold more value? Well, the one that you receive from your daughter probably won't be very good. Ali used to draw me pictures, you know, she wasn't the artist that she is now, both her and Amy, and they would draw me pictures. And I'm a good dad, but I'd be terrible if I looked at them and said, please don't draw me anymore, pictures. Please don't draw me, you made my head so big, I'm, I'm, of, I'm offended. That this makes me feel like you hate me, you know what I mean? No, of course, I receive it. Even though it's imperfect, I receive it because of the fact that the artist would be breaking perfection for the sake of the craft. But my daughter is doing it for my sake. She's giving it to me. On the one hand, the art is the focus. On the other hand, I'm the focus. This is what it is for you. You and I in our worship, that's why God says make a joyful noise. I'm so thankful that it's about making a joyful noise. I remember I was in Bethel once, and um, I was sitting beside this strapping young lad. Like, I mean, he was put together, good-looking chap. And I'm sitting there thinking, at the time, I'm thinking, you know, man, I got daughters marrying age, buddy. You know, like, we should talk. And then worship started. And he stood up, and and I could tell he was just primed for worship. And he stood up, and he began to sing with all of his might. And it was horrific. (laughs) Oh, my Lord, it was terrible. That boy could not sing to save his life. If notes had handles, he would have been in trouble. That's how bad it, he couldn't carry a tune to save himself. It was awful. It was on the verge of offensive. But the beauty of his heart was shining through, and it was just so lovely to, to, to sit beside him making a joyful noise. And it was noise. And yet I could sense the pleasure of God over his praise. Because God was, it, it wasn't about what he was doing, it was who he was doing it for. God loves the imperfection in your perfection. God loves it. That's why your praise holds such value to him. Because it's about yours. Listen, I've said this before. God doesn't lack worship. It's not like he's in lack in heaven. And it's not like we could do anything here on earth that would even compare to the excellence that he already possesses in heaven. His team has played for eternity. They're tight. The point is, is that God desires your worship because it's about him, not about your craft. Now, the second reason why worship matters so much, why your worship holds so much value, is your perspective of his beauty. 1 Peter 1 and 8, though you haven't, you, though you haven't seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory. Remember the time that Thomas was with Jesus 
and, and he got to touch his wounds, and then Jesus said, you know, you're blessed because you've seen and believed, but even more blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. You know, we don't get to see him. I'm sure on that day when we do get to see him, we're going to be flabbergasted as, as to the hugeness of his beauty. I think we're going to be overwhelmed, but right now we take it by faith. We believe that he's as beautiful as he says he is. True worship doesn't look, at the, doesn't look for the stuff of God. True worship is caught up in his beauty by faith. Because he said, this is what he said. And I'm believing this is who he is. And I'm worshiping you in that. Oh, there are times where he manifests himself in healing. When he manifests himself in rain in a building. When in a, on Azusa Street, they, the fire engines would come off him because they would say the building's on fire and it would just be a supernatural fire that people were seeing and there was no fire there, but there was fire there. You know, There's been places where, where God's filled the room with smoke. It's incredible what God does. And there are times when that's tangible. But the bottom line is, by faith, we're engaging his beauty. Yes, we feel him, and that will be what it is. You see, you'll see him on that day, but the feeling that you'll have when you see him will mean that you do know him. You know, in the Song of Solomon, talks about how the young woman is is laying in her bed and and says, my beloved was at the door calling for me. And I said to him, I just washed my feet. I just got ready for bed. Should I make them all dirty again? And then suddenly, the Bible says that her heart was awakened for love, and she rushes to the door, but he's gone. And so she's searching for her beloved. And she says to the daughters, she says, she says, can you help me find him? Can you help me find my beloved? And and they say, and they say to her, well, tell us what he's, tell us about him. Tell, and 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 she doesn't say this. Well, you know that chariot, that golden chariot with the six black stallions. That's that's his chariot, and it'll be mine because I'm going to be married to him. She doesn't say, you see that, that golden palace on the hill? He, 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 he owns that palace and it's going to be mine because I'm, I'm married. She doesn't, she doesn't say that. She begins to describe who he is, not what he has. And your faith journey, the eyes that faith give you, allow you to see who he is before you see what he has. Finally, and this is the most important, and I'm going to close here in just a moment. Your privilege of tension. Your perfected imperfection. Your perspective on his beauty, but finally, your privilege of tension. The Bible says in Psalm 144 that men are like breath. His days are like a passing shadow. There's an old hymn that says there's coming a day where no more sorrows will remain. There's coming a day, there's gonna be a day when you stand before him and you're gonna see him. You're gonna see him in all of his beauty, in all of his glory. In awestruck wonder, you're gonna behold what you've believed for all those years. You're gonna see him and it's gonna be magnificent. And there'll be no more pain, there'll be no trials, There'll be no sickness, no fear, no tears. There'll be no physical limitations to your capacity for worship. You'll be free. And that's what makes your privilege of tension so unique. Because right now, and only now, do you have the extreme privilege, because it'll never happen in eternity ever again, to worship him when you don't understand. To worship him when you're in your pain. To worship him when you're in your trial. There will be no other time in eternity. This is the only window of time that you have in your eternal existence to worship God when it doesn't make sense. Worship team, if you could prepare yourselves. My friends, Yesterday is gone forever. You will never be able to relive yesterday's opportunities for worship. Can you see the urgency to make sure that you don't get caught in the missed opportunities to love on God in this unique season of privilege where after eternity you will never have the opportunity again 
to lift him up when you're in pain and experience comfort and experience perspective. Because when you're there, you'll have it. Oh, it'll be amazing. Don't get me wrong. But I think that there will be something in the measure of knowing him that will be increased in that day because of the stewardship of today. There is a sweetness about the love that's expressed in tension that holds great value to our God. My friends, God loves you. Your most appropriate response is to love him back. My friends, you only have this time. That's why it's an urgent time. Because every chance that we get now when we gather, this is, this is the last today that we'll have to worship together in our tension, together in our imperfection, together in our limited understanding of his beauty, but our choice to know him by faith before we see him in the flesh. Father, I'm asking in your name that as we even enter into this time of worship, that Jesus, you would awaken our souls to the fullness of the wonder of your nature. So God, right now, I return to the cross. I return to the wonder of the cross. And I allow myself, Lord, to be reminded of this incredible covenant. Now, before we worship, I want to give opportunity. If you're here, I explained the gospel to you. God made a covenant with himself so that it could be kept forever, so that you and I could have a saving relationship with him, of intimacy, of knowing him, and of experiencing the wonder of the fullness of his spirit and receiving an inheritance. All of that is yours. It's yours for the taking, should you choose. All you need to do is choose. All you need to do is say, yes, Lord, I want to be ransomed. I'm a hostage, and I want to be free. And I'm going to look from this far side all the way across to the other side. If you're here today and you haven't asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you haven't come into the covenant, oh, you are missing out on life and life abundantly. It isn't about rules. It isn't about having to give up everything. It's about falling in love with Jesus and letting him bring you into being your best you purpose of salvation isn't to turn you into something else. It's actually for you to fully experience what you were created to be. And so when I look across, I'm going to ask you to wave your hand at me, and then I'm going to ask you to stand, not because we want to embarrass you, but because we want to pray with you, because we're thrilled for you, because it's the best day of your life, best decision you'd ever make. So I'm looking across right now. If there's anybody Quickly, I want you to raise a hand. Be brave. Don't be afraid. Raise a hand. I want to see it. Nice and high. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Nothing to be afraid or ashamed of. Quickly. I'm just still looking across. Okay, I'm coming back. I want to give one more chance. If you were scared the first time, go after it the second time. This is the last chance. You might think, ah, uh, maybe not today. I can do it another day. No, today's the best day. Today's the absolute best day. Anybody else? Quickly, I'm just looking across. All right, let's stand. Lord Jesus, I pray today that as we lift up your name, that God, you would be so magnified and glorified. Let's spend a little extra time in worship now and go back to the covenant and give him your very best response.
reaches here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yeah, I
we give God like the biggest applause ever right now? That is so good. So good. I don't know about I don't know about anybody else, but anybody else like me glad that it doesn't have to sound good for it to be worship? Because man, I, I no matter what I try and do, I cannot make it sound good. But what I can do is posture my heart in the right position, in the right posture, so that it's worship. And the same forgiveness, it's like, man, I wish I could give as much money as so-and-so, but I could give all my money and it still wouldn't be as much as so-and-so. But I can put my heart in the right position, in the right posture, so I can worship God in that way. Does that make sense? So if our heart's in the right position like it is right now, we could experience this tomorrow. Maybe not singing with this many people at work, but your heart can be in that same posture of worship at work. Amen? It's just a choice we've got to make. Please honor our pastor for that great word this morning. That was phenomenal. I'm going to invite the ministry team to be over here. And if you want prayer for anything, the ministry team is over here. They'd love to chat with you and pray with you if you need that. And also, if you want to meet Jesus today, I'd love to, I'd be over here. I'd love to chat with you as well and introduce you to Jesus and tell you what it's all about living your life as a Christian. Otherwise, have an incredible week. And if you are a guest here this morning, you want to connect, make sure you visit our guest center over there. And if you want to get plugged into a home group, also check out the guest center. Have an amazing week, everybody. God bless.